I'm very happy to have you here. The question everyone wants to know is who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Let's start with that. That's a great question. I'll tell you what, I'm going to just mention a couple things here as I enter into that. It is not an easy question to answer, and it's fairly controversial. Of course, I'm going to give you the correct answer. My view is correct. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but uh, I really want to mention this book. I want you to highlight this book. Uh, you can see it's a nice, thick paperback book. I think it is, what, uh, 500 pages? So this book, it's written by Vander Cam and Flint. Uh, Peter Flint uh, passed away a few years ago. James Vander Cam, very important. I taught with him at Notre Dame. You mentioned teaching at Notre Dame. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the, the title, The Meaning of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is your one-stop shop. All the theories, all the possibilities are covered. It's an amazing book. How do you date them and what are they and all the possible theories. And then you need the scrolls, obviously. Yeah. This is a uh, V-E-R-M-E-S is the translator, Geza Vermish. That's the one I have. Uh, that's the one you have, you can see. Now, Neil, when I started studying the scrolls in graduate school back in the 70s, here's this. I had this very edition, this book, but guess what? I had the first edition. It was uh, this many scrolls. Wow. And now look what we have. Wow. So we have more than doubled our uh, scrolls. I also want to mention two things. Uh, we're in the 75th year. So look at this. Life magazine, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Nice, beautiful color special issue. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is really timely that we're doing this interview. And then look at this. Lovely issue. You can find it in the grocery store, newsstand. I got. I even ordered it on Amazon. The Dead Sea Scrolls, 75 years since their historic discovery. Both of these are great to get, and I hope your viewers will maybe read those and take a look at them. Absolutely. So here, here's the challenge we have in uh, dealing with who wrote the scrolls. First of all, we have to say what is in the scrolls because there's not a one answer to who wrote them. For example, 40% uh, of the scrolls are copies of what we call the Hebrew Bible. Well, obviously the group did not write those scrolls. That's, those are the scrolls that they considered their Bible. And every book except for Esther has been discovered. And there's a possibility that Esther also and fragments has been discovered as well. And that's all covered in Vanderkam and Flint's book. But, you know, there's depending on you count it, how you count it, the Christians count 39 books of what they call the Old Testament. The way the Jews number the books, it would be 22 or 24, depending on how you combine Ezra, Nehemiah, and so forth. But it's the same It's the same number of books that are in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament canon, as we refer to it. So this group, that was their Bible. They, they, they have Isaiah, they have Jeremiah, they have Genesis. They, so 40% of the scrolls, almost half, are their copies of the Bible. Now, you might think at that point, uh, you might yawn and think, oh, well, we already have that. But get this. These copies are a thousand years older than any copies that we have. Wow. Uh, the uh, standard Hebrew text uh, that scholars use is, is called the BHS. You can get many Hebrew Bibles in Hebrew, but uh, that's the one that the scholars use. That's the Leningrad Codex, dates about 1000 CE, AD. Uh, and now we have a copy of Isaiah that was found in Cave One. There are 11 caves that scrolls were found in. It, we think it might even date to 100 or 200 BCE, BC. So you jumped 1000 to 1200 years. Now, we're not going to do this tonight, but if we do another show, I want to talk about the Dead Sea Scroll Bible. Hmm. That will be interesting because everyone wonders if we've got a copy of Isaiah that's over a thousand years older than the copies we had, the Leningrad Codex, 
which is the oldest complete copy of the Hebrew Bible from the Middle Ages, is it going to read the same? Right. Now, everybody gets real nervous here, and you're going to hear the more fundamentalists and conservative scholars will tend to emphasize, oh, well, it's basically the same. There's some small spelling, you know, differences and so forth. Uh, well, you know, it is basically the same, if you'll define basically for me. But what about hundreds and hundreds of readings of extra interpolations or rather i shouldn't say interpolations but extra material that's there uh there's a lot of differences wow. in in the uh what we call the dead sea scroll bible so obviously the group did not write those but they're passing on their version of the bible or the hebrew bible is their bible secondly about a third of the scrolls so 40 percent plus 30 percent we're getting up there is not written by the group either so when you say who wrote the scrolls i'm talking about books like enoch jubilees you probably you know studied and heard a bit about these books these are books that are not in the hebrew bible they're not even in the apocrypha which are the extra books that roman catholics accept uh they're books that they're usually called pseudepigrapha i don't particularly like that term because it means false writings Wow. I mean, should we really have a, a way of describing uh, ancient writings as false writings? Yeah, I agree. As if there's true writings? I mean, it's just writings. I agree. And by the way, Enoch is quoted in the New Testament by Jude in the letter of Jude. Yes. I don't think he think it, he didn't think it was a false writing. That's I guarantee you, he didn't call it a pseudepigrapha. He said, Jude, the seventh from Adam prosopheth prophesied saying the guy who wrote jude whoever it was it could have been the brother of jesus that's the traditional attribution but he thought enoch was inspired yeah this group thinks enoch is inspired they particularly love the book of jubilees and they have other books like that that are books not in the hebrew bible but books known to us and they studied these books and the reason they love jubilees is it uses the calendar that they approved of. We'll get to that in a minute. It's uh, you know a little bit later tonight uh, or during this session. We're doing it in the evening. Now, so that leaves what? We got 40, 50, 30%, right? Of other scrolls written by the group. So when people ask who wrote the scrolls, that's usually what they meant. You know, what they mean, obviously. They're talking about what we might call the sectarian scrolls. But sectarian is also a little bit of problem for me because I want to give all groups of Judaism equal status. And if you start talking about mainstream Judaism is this and the sect is this, you've already diminished it and put it down, right? Just like we talk about cults and sects. Oh, this person's a member of a cult or a sect, but this other person is a Baptist or a Presbyterian. Those are like the approved religions. We don't want to do that if we're doing history of religions. Uh, I, I'm not real keen on uh, characterizations of them, but as you'll see, uh, we'll get into the question of the Essenes. So the common opinion that you're always going to hear is that that so-called sectarian material, and I'm going to tend to call it the, the text that the group themselves produced, it would be like, the Christians, the early followers of Jesus, produced the New Testament, their own writings, and it wasn't put together in a book, but letters of Paul and the early Gospels and so forth. Well, this group wrote things themselves, which is their own understanding of who they are and what they believe and what they're waiting for and what they're expecting in a similar way that we study some of the New Testament documents to understand the Jesus movement and the early followers of Jesus. So who were those people, now that I've clarified what I mean by who wrote, uh, who are the people that wrote the so-called sectarian scrolls, or who? Were, what is this group? And what people tend to do is they want to do, they want a label, right? So for example, in the New Testament, you read about Pharisees and Sadducees. 
you recently read, I believe you told me that you spent some considerable time reading book two of Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, first century Jewish historian, born in 37 CE, lived up through the Roman War into the 90s CE, and of course was a general in the Jewish revolt for a while until he surrendered to the general Vespasian, who later became the emperor. So Josephus, in writing the Jewish War, it's written around 75 CE, he's living in Rome, in the former palace of the emperor Vespasian, and he's writing the Jewish war, the history of the Jewish war that he had actually lived through and been part of and been an eyewitness to. And at one point in book two, and everybody should read it who's interested in the scrolls, for many pages, he, he briefly tells you the Pharisees were this and the Sadducees were this and the Zealots were this, four, four different groups, but the three main ones are the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes. And for Essenes, he goes on page after page after page. He goes like he's chapter. really interested in this one. I would say it's it, it's easily 10 times more information on them yep. than the brief paragraph that he gives for the Pharisees and Sadducees. And since they're not mentioned by name, at least, and we can talk about that in the New Testament, you know, like you go all the way through the New Testament, it never says, Oh, and then an Essene came up and said to Jesus, so they're not mentioned. Everybody's heard of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But here's the problem with just, you know, we could just end it here with that question and go on and say, oh, well, the Essenes wrote them. But here's the problem. If you look at what Josephus says about the Essenes, some of it does fit what we read in the scrolls about this group describing themselves. Some of it does. For example, communal living very strict interpretations of Torah, uh, quite a few other things, but there's huge important pillars of the faith, of their faith that Josephus does not mention. For example, he never says that they're apocalyptic. This group is probably next to the Jesus movement, uh, which is more first century. This is probably flourish. I, I would tend to date the scrolls uh, uh, a little later than uh, is the traditional view. Traditional view is it's during the Maccabean period and certainly after, you know, the early Heshmoneans. I would go a little further down into the first century BCE, sure. maybe 75 or so right in that period and on down with the Romans coming in in 63. Remember, the Romans came in in 63 BC. And that's a good point because Pompey the Great is is around is 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 he's in the East in that time conquering Asia Minor. Right. They, uh, so the uh, we're, we're, and, this, and I'm gonna we're gonna get into this, but the uh, the War Scroll could be reflecting that because obviously, obviously we'll get into that though. It could be, yeah. So so the big thing, uh, and I'll name several big things, but one big thing is they're very apocalyptic, and I've got a list here I made uh, for you. And I think I sent this to you, but here's how I would describe the group. And since you read Josephus, you're going to see immediately that only a couple of these things he mentions for the Essenes. So even if I say, okay, Neil, they were the Essenes, and all you know about Essenes is what Josephus says, you're not going to even get close to understanding the group. Because what he's trying, what Josephus is trying to do is write for the emperor. He's basically wanting to, uh, I think, uh, say, hey, we Jews, we have great philosophical sex just like you right. Greeks and Romans do. We have the Essenes. They're like the Pythagoreans. We have the Stoics. Uh, I mean, we have the, uh, it would be the Pharisees. They're like the Stoics. And we have the Sadducees. They're like the Epicureans. That's what he's trying to do. He's not trying to give a historical ex description. Now, I think he knows what they're like, but he wants Vespasian to actually like them. If Vespasian knew what this group was all about, what we now know in the scrolls, and any of them were still around, oh boy, he would put out the word, you hunt these guys down, you crucify them, you get rid of them because they're a threat to Rome. Well, imagine, and they were. They imagine, were. 
Imagine if Josephus was like, hey, um, Vespasian, just so you know, you are the leader of the Sons of Darkness. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So here's my list. Apocalyptic, Messianic. He never says they believe the Messiah or expecting. Oh, that would be a buzzword. Vespasian would have a heart attack. There's a messianic group still out there. I thought I got rid of all those kind of crazy people. And the Messiah is supposed to be a king. If they hear the word king, no, no, no. Bad, bad, bad. (laughs) So apocalyptic, messianic, new covenant. Now, this patient wouldn't even know what that meant. But Jeremiah 31, 31 says in the last days, God will make a new covenant. Well, a new covenant requires a new Moses, right? Guess what? They have a teacher. They call him the righteous teacher, the teacher of righteousness. Uh, Dr. John Reeves, who teaches with me at UNC Charlotte, he's made a really good argument and published this, that teacher of righteousness really means the true teacher. You know, not like he taught some righteous stuff, but the right teacher. They also call him the unique teacher, same idea, and the beloved teacher. This guy is it. He's a prophet like Moses. So he can inaugurate a new covenant and give all the proper interpretations. He's basically going to reveal the version of the true faith of following the God of Israel for the last days. They baptize. I'm using baptism just for people to understand. Jews don't baptize the way Christians do. But the idea of water initiation rites, immersion in water, To join this group, you go through this initiation. Josephus does mention that, by the way. They're separatists. What does that mean? That means they think all the other groups are going to hell, to put it bluntly. And I mean hell. They talk all the time about the wrath of God and the fires of hell and damnation are coming upon all, even their fellow Jews that are not part of the group. They are also the sons of darkness, not just the Romans. Anyone that's not part of this group is a son of darkness or a child of darkness. Uh, Communal living. So apocalyptic, messianic, uh, communal living and so forth, following this teacher, this unique teacher. Here's the big one. If you ask them, what are you doing out by the Dead Sea? Why did you retreat to the wilderness as it's translated in the old King James? You know, well... Do you remember when John the baptizer, this is a bit later than this group, but he's asked, what are you doing? Why are you out by the Jordan River, which is runs into the Dead Sea? Why are you out here? He says, oh, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 3. Guess what? In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the very most important scroll, it's called the Community Rule, 1QS is what scholars call it. Cave 1, Q is Qumran, S means Serik or Rule. So the Community Rule, we can call it in English, it's like their charter. It's like, here's what we are, and here's what we believe, and here's what we're waiting for, and here's what we're expecting, and that's where you get all that language. And guess what they say? This is the time for preparing the way in the wilderness. Now, this is 100 years before John the Baptist even existed. And this group is saying, let's go. And they're taking it literally. If I'm in, if I fly to Tel Aviv, which I've done many times, I get to Ben Gurion Airport, I walk out the baggage claim, and I hail a cab. You know what I can say in Hebrew? I can say, I want to go to the Arava. And you know what? That cab driver would know Arava, A-R-A-V-A, Arava. You might know it as Araba, Arabia, right? Oh. See? Remember when Paul goes into Arabia, everybody, oh, did he go down to Mecca or Medina or what? Well, it'd be a little early for that. It means he went down into the Rift Valley of the Jordan sure. and the Dead Sea. So they're taking this literally, prepare the way in the Arava. That's the word for the desert. It's a geographical term. Just like if we say the Sahara Desert, go prepare the way, or the Great Mojave Desert. It doesn't just mean pick some desert somewhere. 
it's a specific geographical location. The other thing, look on a map at Qumran, and I know you're going to put up some great visuals. If you look at Qumran and go right across the Dead Sea from the west to the east, to the Jordanian side, you're going to come to where Moses uh, is traditionally buried, according to Deuteronomy, the last chapter of Deuteronomy, Mount Nebo and Mount Pisgah across from Jericho. So they want to be, I call this the 50-yard line of the apocalypse. They want to be in place when God's glory returns in the day of judgment. And they also want to be uh, removed and separate from uh, the mainstream Judaism. They think the temple's very corrupt up in Jerusalem, uh, even though it's Herod's built these beautiful buildings. But they even began before the reign of Herod the Great. But they think the temple, it, it's a building, but it's a, it's a house without any inhabitants because the spirit of God has left that place. Wow. And so they just think it's a, it's just a, a shell. And they also think they're using the wrong calendar. And they think they have the wrong interpretation of how to uh, keep the Torah. And we could go into some examples later, like how did they differ with Pharisees, Sadducees, and so forth. But you can see already, just to slap the word Essene on them, it really doesn't get you very far. Uh, when my students, they, you know, they've always heard, I, I'm teaching a course this semester on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and some of the students, or graduate students, they know quite a bit, and they'll go like, well, Dr. Tabor, weren't these written by the Essenes? You know what I say? I say, uh, give me your definition of an Essene and how you know what an Essene is. Like, where did you learn or find this? Say, well, if they know what, and, you know, if they study it, they say, well, Josephus mentions them, as we said. Pliny the Elder, a Roman writer who, who, by the way, perished at Pompeii, the eruption of Pompeii. And Philo, very well-known Jewish philosopher down in Alexandria in Egypt. He mentions the Essenes. He mentions another group called the Therapeutae that sound kind of like maybe Essene-like. So that's what you would know. But guess what? If you read all three of those accounts, you're not going to get apocalyptic, messianic, preparing the way in the wilderness, new covenant, following the future. That's not what you're going to get. And so I don't think the word gets us very far. I would rather use their words. And you know how they describe themselves? The new covenanters. I mean, that's a hard word to say because we say covenant, but try new. Uh, we, who are you? you? We are people of the way. You know what? The new covenanters. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of how the Greek historians like Herodotus, they call the people in the in the uh, in the east the Phoenicians, but really they're not called it. That's that means purple people in Greek. Really, they're the Sidonians, they're the Tyrians. They're absolutely people. exactly. And this is the way ethnography works, where people go for labels, and those labels sometimes have an earlier meaning or a different meaning as time goes on. So, you know, I'm just going to say again, read the scrolls. You yeah. say, well, where are they Essenes? Where they? Read the scrolls. Uh, you'll see what they are. And what you're going to find is there are these pretty amazing parallels with the Jesus movement that comes 100 years later. So when the scrolls were discovered, like all of the things I just read, that description that I've gone over, that would also apply to, I think, the movement around John the Baptist, Jesus, and James. You know, what we could roughly call the Jesus movement. That's why I think Eisenman is very helpful. You know, a lot of scholars don't like Eisenman and they criticize him and he's considered a maverick. But you know what he says that's very helpful? He says, we should be talking about the Messianic movement in the late Second Temple period or even Messianic movements but they're all kind of animals of the same color in the sense that the Pharisees are very establishment, the Sadducees are very establishment, and this messianic movement is the movement that thinks they're living near the end of the age. They think they're gonna live to see the end of the age as this group did, as the Jesus movement did. Remember in the gospels, this generation will not pass till all these things are fulfilled. 
Paul saying uh, very early in First Thessalonians, his very first letter, he says, we who are alive at the coming of Jesus will rise to meet him. He thinks he's going to live to see it. And he didn't, of course. He died. So this is a very apocalyptic group, just like the Jesus movement. And it's a, think of it as kind of streams of apocalyptic messianism flowing through history, uh, starting around the time of the Maccabees. I like 100 BCE to about 100 CE. It's a nice 200 year period that I study. That way you can include Bar Kokhba, whom as you know, was another Messiah that came after the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem around 135. But that shows you Messianism is still thriving and the Romans still have to deal with it. And Hadrian, believe me, he was very well aware of this and was very, very determined that this would never rise again. And he actually hunted down anyone who could have a possible claim to the bloodline of King David wow. and uh, often would execute them. And Vespasian did the same thing. He was hunting for people that could maybe have the pedigree to claim to be the Messiah. So that would be my long answer to who wrote the scrolls. Uh, That's the, answer. The, the, the who wrote the scrolls is the group described in the scrolls. They wrote the scrolls as far as the 30%. But uh, there is the possibility that uh, Stephen Gorenson has suggested, and I've always found it attractive, that these people do call themselves the doers yes the doers very interesting paul says not the hearers but the doers he refers to that in romans jesus said don't be hearers of the word be doers of the word just this idea of being a doer right james, james has that in, the, in his james life. has it as well so guess what in hebrew osim now listen osim haturah the doers of the Torah, osim esim, very, very close. If you put it into Greek, you could see how, so it's possible that uh, Gorenson's right, that esim is just saying the doers. So, you know, the doers of the Torah. Well, then you have to ask, well, what was their view of being a doer of the Torah? And that's where you're going to get this exclusive separationist, we are right, everybody else is wrong, children of light, children of darkness. And since you mentioned it, let me just throw in, in case I might forget. I mean, we could do a whole show on parallels between the Jesus movement as we know it in the New Testament and as we know it in the movement in the scrolls. But sons of light, sons of darkness, you mentioned. Yeah. Guess what? In all of Jewish literature, I'm talking about Hebrew Bible, so-called pseudepigrapha, apocrypha, the Mishnah, the Talmuds, the Tosefta, all of Jewish literature. The phrase, the phrases, son, children of light, children of darkness, we find only in the scrolls and one other place. Where's that? Paul in First Thessalonians talks about you are children of light. Oh, yeah. And Jesus says to his followers, you're the children of light, not the children of darkness. Now, that is amazing. And people got pretty excited. You can imagine 75 years ago when these were first found and people began to read them. They thought, OK, it's not Jesus, but he's he's the true teacher. It's not Jesus, but this guy brought the new covenant. It's not Jesus, but this guy talked about sons of light sons of darkness you see you could go make all these parallels and he calls the temple the 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 teacher says the temple is corrupt and it, it's literally uh, defiled what did jesus say about the temple a den of robbers you see that idea right and uh, so essentially people got kind of nervous like wait is is the jesus movement kind of a second run you know, like the Essenes kind of died out and the, their their prophecies didn't come through and then it got revived in the first century. Uh, I don't think it's exactly that, you know, like you could just make a one on one because there are also some very significant differences we can talk yeah. about. And I think 
think just one of to conclude that I would just say, uh, you know, okay, Essene, fine, but realize that the classic definitions of Essene that we get from these three main uh, Roman writers, uh, that's not going to really help you with understanding the heart and soul of this group. Right. And I think it's, I think it's also important to mention in book two of the, of the wars, uh, Josephus talks about there being two different kinds of Essenes. One of them are really strict, like don't marry. And, you know, they're out in the sort of like in, in the, I think he says in the wilderness, but there's another one where he says they are city dwellers and they do marry. And I think it's also important when you're comparing them to the Christians, the he Josephus makes it very clear that all these scenes, both the groups, are very strict on the Sabbath. In fact, he says they're more strict than the other two groups when it comes to the That's Sabbath. Right. I'll give you two examples that uh, one of which I was involved in archaeologically at Qumran. Uh, Josephus mentions this about the Essenes, and it's also in the scrolls. There's a command in the Torah that you cannot go out of your house on the Sabbath, your dwelling. It's called your dwelling. Now, if you're really strict, you're going to call your dwelling like your house, you know, like your bedroom, your bathroom, your courtyard. That's your house. Now, the Pharisees had already begun to make allowances. We don't know how early, but we think pretty early to say, well, couldn't we call the whole town our house like you know, our dwelling could be a little village, could be your dwelling. And uh, today, for example, in Jerusalem, which is a big sprawling city of upwards of a million people, if you count all the outskirts, they've got a wire going all around the city up on like what you call like telephone poles. And that means that it has an enclosure, even though it's a wire. Wow. And they said that Jerusalem is declared a single dwelling therefore anybody in the city of jerusalem on the sabbath can walk their baby in the carriage they don't drive but they can walk around they can visit people and so forth this group would be horrified at that to them if you don't go out of your dwelling uh you certainly can't le leave the uh what they call the the camp the camp of the saints which is the qumran uh, settlement, I believe. I think the archaeology backs it up. So I got to thinking about that because one of the things that's mentioned by Josephus and the scrolls is the toilet. You have to put your latrines or toilets northwest of the camp. I think that has to do with prevailing winds. You don't want to be smelling stuff. You know, you want the uncleanness to kind of go away. Not a bad and idea. Yeah, and secondly, it's got to be out of sight so that if you're in the camp and you look out across the desert and you see a few people up there relieving themselves, squatting down, that's like, I don't want to see that. You know, I'm trying to have some holy thoughts here. And so uh, Joe Zias and I, Joe's an anthropologist, friend of mine, several years ago, and we published this. It's in uh, Dead Sea Scroll Discoveries. We published it. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's in uh, it's in um, the Qumran Journal. It's in the Qumran Journal, not Dead Sea Scroll Discoveries. I'm trying to think where we did it. Um, I can't, it's been several years, but anyway, it's published, and I have blog posts on it and so forth. And we went uh, northwest of the camp, paced off a thousand cubits, went a little further than that. And there's this kind of rock formation just to the northwest. And behind it, we began to do a soil samples. And then we also did soil samples in other areas as a kind of a blind test. And we have we had the soil tested. And as Joe put it, it's a it's a toxic waste dump for human uh, waste. We even found the remains of tapeworms in in some of those remains. Ooh. And so uh, Josephus says, isn't this admirable? They would not go to the toilet for 24 hours from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, keeping the Sabbath. 
And uh, my students always giggle when I say that because they picture like as soon as the sun's down and they announce it, okay, the Sabbath's over, they'd all be running, you know, out of the camp to head out for these latrines. Uh, and we think the tapeworm thing, uh, Joe does medical anthropology, that's his field, Josias, and he thinks it might uh, account for uh, some of the the skeletons that have been looked at, many of them are dying in their 40s and 50s. Now, I know there's a common op opinion that people have, and it's erroneous, that, oh, ancient people, they all died in their, if you were 40, you were old. That's not true. Right. Uh, what's, what the, where you get those averages is that, that, you know, if you had like five children, uh, how many are going to reach the age of five, six, seven, or eight, then they're probably going to survive on up to say 50 or 60. But it's not like everybody died at 30 or 40, but Joe's worked a lot with the skeletons at Qumran. There's a, there's a cemetery right by the settlement with 1,100 graves. They haven't all been excavated because it's against the law to excavate them. But over the years, before the laws were enforced, people did examine some of the tombs as samples. Uh, all male, for the most part. I think they found a couple of females, but on the fringe, and Joe, Joe concluded that those are later burials that maybe the Bedouin used you know, over the ages as they, oh, there's a cemetery, you know, we'll just kind of add our people to this cemetery. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he speculated and it's speculation. We call it the high cost of being holy. So I'm going to be real holy and keep the Sabbath and I'm not going to go to the toilet. But then as soon as the Sabbath's over, I'm going to go to the toilet and I'm going to, you know, relieve myself with a whole group of other people. And then I'm going to walk back to the camp and before you can enter the camp you have to go into the ritual immersion pool and i've just been out walking in this area where people are doing their business and then covering it over with dirt now remember josephus mentions that he said everybody gets a shovel if you join this group you get a little paddle or shovel we've actually found a couple of those oh, wow i didn't know why yeah. he said that yeah because they got to cover their poop that, See, oh my god that's so cool I, and the reason they got to cover their poop is that god's presence is in that area and this is in the torah he doesn't be he doesn't want to be walking around the camp and see a pile of dog poop i did an in episode case, with human poop the way we would feel about dog poop on the sidewalk you know? i did an episode with dr bob a couple of a couple like a week or two ago and we were talking about the essenes and i was like and i this is right after i read book two right after you told me to read this yeah and I was fresh in my mind. And I said, Josephus mentions this weird thing. He says it twice, actually. If they get a hatchet, or it says, it says, it says hatchet in my version, but which could mean shovel, I guess. But he says, I'm like, well, I don't know why it says that. Well, that's weird. But you just answered that question. That's that's really good. That's right. And we found a couple of those. Uh, you, you can, uh, you'll can you probably be able to pull the visual and put it up. So anyway, we, we, we felt like what's happening is they're walking in this soil. Now remember, they're out there for over 100 years, uh, way up into the Roman War. So maybe even 100, you know, if you go from, let's say they were there around 75 BC, and then the Romans finally destroyed Jerusalem and come down to Jericho in the fall of 70. After destroying Jerusalem, they burned Jericho, they burned Qumran. These people are scattering. So you've had 140 years of people using the toilet in a specific area. If you've got a thousand graves, dead people, how many times have those people used the toilet in that exact area? You see? Wow. So his theory is that they're going to have cuts on their feet. You know, you're living in the desert. You're going to have, it's just yeah. anyone who lives in the desert with sandals, you just have cuts on your feet and so forth. And then they're going to go in the mikvah, the pool, Get infected. and they're going to put their eyes and their head under. All the orifices of the face are going to get infected. And, uh, of course, now we can't, we can't see the organs or anything. Uh, but uh, it just seems like the, the tapeworms could have been pretty rampant. And wow. if you have really bad tapeworms, uh, you do die an early death. This is Joe's theory. Wow. And, I certainly want to consider it as a possibility. Sure. 
So that's one of the things that uh, is really, really interesting from the standpoint of archaeology that kind of corresponds. The other thing is they have around the camp where they live, the Qumran settlement, a wall that delineates the sacred from what we call the profane or the ordinary. This is common in all religions so that they, when you're in the camp, you can't enter the camp without going into the pool of ritual immersion. Mm. You're, you in a sense are then the temple. You know, like, I'm not saying that dirt wall, it's actually made out of kind of a baked stone, baked, baked clay and so forth. It's built up. It's, it's, it's almost not down now, but you can still see it in an aerial shot going around. Uh, that's like the perimeters of holiness. So when you've entered into the camp, you have to live a holy life. And that would be, I think, why the women are not at Qumran. I think they can come to Qumran, but not enter the camp because the men in the camp have to keep themselves free from any kind of sexual thoughts or activities and devote themselves to holiness. So it's like separate from women. Remember in the Torah, it says, if you have sexual intercourse with a woman, you cannot go to the temple that day. You know, it's not because sexual intercourse is evil or dirty or anything like that. You don't mix bathroom things, sexual things. If you visit a cemetery, you can't go to the temple. It's basically sex, blood, and death. Wow. If you want a shorthand, right? Yeah. And this is not just Jewish. Did you oh. know the Temple of Athena has the same rules in Corinth? We you found know, inscriptions, and it says if you have had sex the night before with your wife, you can't yeah. come till the do next you know, day. Do you, yeah. do you, have you ever read the Zend of Vesta, the uh, Zoroastrian text? I've read some of them, but uh, I'm not joking. It's they almost, say the same thing. It's yeah. almost the same, except they're even stricter. They're like, you can't even cut your nails off. That's an yeah. abomination. If you cut your nail and leave it on the ground, that's like the the, the spirit of Angramanu. Oh, yeah. is is within all dead um skin nails hair you can't yeah. cut your, if you cut your hair it's got to be brought away out of the city all that stuff so like to, to your point this is this is the norm and all it's these pretty places. universal in antiquity and it has to do with what eliade eliade is the famous university of chicago professor he wrote a book called the sacred and the profane very important book. And he's making this point and he shows how universal it is. I, I, I was at Chicago when he was still alive. So I got to take a course with him. Amazing uh, scholar of history of religions. And uh, so sex, blood and death. I, if you ask why those things, those are the signs of mortality, right? In other words, Jesus says in the resurrection, just to take one example, People are asking, well, if somebody died and then somebody else married the person and, you know, whose wife will the, the whose husband will be with this woman or whose wife, you know, whose wife will she be and so forth? And he goes, no, no, no. The resurrection is not gendered. You know, it's not male, female. Paul says some of the same kind of things. So it's not that sex is wrong, but it, you don't mix it with the sacred in the sacred area you don't have sex in the temple in other words you know the opposite of some of the greek traditions and then blood it could be menstruation it could be any kind of blood and then death particularly and mary douglas a very a modern anthropologist uh she wrote purity and danger it's the same idea purity where you're okay and then danger where you could get zapped Wow. And the Apostle Paul has a very similar idea of where he tells his followers, you're the temple of God. You mm -hmm. people are the temple of God. And then there's a guy living with his father's wife. I don't think it's his mother. Personally, I don't think that fits, but probably his father died. You know, I'm just guessing. Yeah. And the woman and, and the woman that he had married, uh, the son thinks, you know, maybe they were the same age or close in age and the father's dead. I mean, isn't she OK to marry? And Paul is just appalled at this because he considers it incest. 
And this group is talking about similar things as far as how to define incest. And he says, when you're gathered together and the spirit of the Lord Jesus is there. See, it's a spiritual gathering. These are not just like town hall meetings. They feel like the spirit of God is in this place. And he goes, and my spirit is present. So Paul actually thought he could project like his spirit as the wow. as the true teacher, I think. That's crazy. And he said, deliver this guy to Satan. Kick him out of the group for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord that he thinks is coming very soon. So he's hoping the guy, if they kick him out into the community again, into the Hellenistic culture, the world of idols and the world of demons and spirits and so forth, he'll lose his protection and maybe he'll get sick. You know, he says that he, he could maybe get sick, maybe he'll have an accident, maybe he'll something could happen to him that'll shake him and then he might repent in time to get back into the group wow. so <laughs> there's always this idea that uh <clears throat> that basically this group of the saints are holy their camp is holy and they in effect are replacing the temple yeah, and that's such a good point because you see this in Christianity where there's no more need for the temple, no more need for the law. There's, you're circumcised in the heart. And, you know, so when, I, when I'm looking at this text, right, a lot of people point to this. And I want to run this by you and see what you think. Okay. Mm -hmm. there, there's, the, there's the big difference between the Essenes who are strict on the Sabbath and there's this, even in the scroll, there's a law that says if an animal falls into a ditch, you can't even get that animal out. Well, Jesus sure. literally says, if your animal falls into a ditch, wouldn't you go and get it? Now, my theory, right? Obviously, it sounds like they're, they're, they can't be the same people now, right? Well, right. My, this is my personal theory on this. My personal theory is Christianity comes so much later than these scrolls are written. And I think that by the time Jesus is giving his teachings, he could be coming out of one of the streams of these scenes or uh, messianic apocalyptic people like you like to define it as but he disagrees with this one rule so he wants to he wants to sort of de not debate it but sort of rebuttal this in his own teaching in his own way so what i'm saying is there's a progression happening between jesus and when that was written and by the time it gets to jesus he's aware of this rule which is why he's actually literally going at it like he's going for the juggler he's trying that's to right. refute this law that's what i think what do you think about it's, that? i think that uh, is very close to to uh, likely uh movements tend to start really strict and after a hundred years or so you get the kids and the grandkids and if they stick with it they tend to develop in different directions like you called it streams and also jesus could just be the kind of spiritual leader that looked at all of that and thought well that's not what god really wants you know god looks at the heart he probably would quote things like well we know he quotes hosea 6 uh about i desire mercy not sacrifice you know sacrifice standing for the temple and the literal adherence of clean and unclean and so forth so he he seems to be i don't like the word liberal because that has all kinds of modern political connotations but let's say he has a more humane interpretation and on the sabbath there's another uh passage that goes right in with what the one you're quoting about getting the animal out of the pit uh and that is the disciples are picking grain one day uh, as on the Sabbath, as they're walking along, they're famished. And the Pharisees, according to this text, it's Mark 2, and it's also paralleled in Matthew 12. And Matthew redacts it and adds quite a bit to it. But in Mark 2, it's really interesting what Jesus says. And this would go along with what you're saying. He has a different approach to this kind of thing. In the scrolls, they mention that you've got to prepare your meal before the Sabbath. 
Now, if you're hungry and you, you're walking around, it's like a barley field. Some of your uh, viewers may have been familiar with like wheat harvesting or something. I remember visiting my uncle in Texas and he grew wheat. And when that wheat was ripe, my cousin and I would walk through and we could take our fingers like this and put them together and just go up on the stalk and your whole hand would be full of the wheat grain. Wow. With, with, and you could pop it in your mouth and eat it. Yeah. And you get the wheat germ and everything. And it after you chew it a while, it gets kind of like gum. Then you spit that out. You've got all the nutrition. Right. Now, you can live on that. That's You're getting the goodness of the grain. You're basically spitting out the gluten, the sticky stuff that's left after you chew it. So that's what they're doing. But technically, you're violating the Sabbath because doesn't the Torah say prepare your meal before the Sabbath? Right. You should have already prepared that grain if you want to eat some grain. You should have plucked it before and put it in a little bag and, you know, had it ready. So that's part of it. Also, the Torah says you can't harvest any kind of work. And the, the Pharisees had this whole list of they in the Mishnah, it's 39 kinds of work. So it's like sewing and reaping and actually sewing thread and building and hammering and you know anything you do that's like normal work right and then on the sabbath you can't do any of that thing and of course orthodox jews follow this pretty strictly today this picking grain on the sabbath was definitely a violation by strict interpretation even of the pharisees and especially this qumran group i like to call them the qumran group that are even more strict uh but what does Jesus really say in reply? It's very interesting. Just like he says, who wouldn't take an animal out of a pit on the Sabbath, showing a completely different orientation, even though, as you said, he's got all these other parallels in his movement to the group in the scroll. But that's a very strong difference. So you know what he says? He says, oh, uh, you're criticizing us for picking grain on the Sabbath. What about King David? He went into the temple in his day. It was a tent, what not a building then. And he took the holy bread. It's called the bread of the presence. It's only for the priests. He just passed it out to his troops because they were starving. And he definitely violated the law. So basically what Jesus is saying is like, oh, excuse me, we violated the law. Huh, David violated the law. Sometimes violating the law is like a thing we do. You see what he's saying? No, he's not defending that it's okay. He's just saying, David broke the law and was blameless. And then he says, and this is the amazing, the Sabbath is made for people, not people for the Sabbath. Wow. Now, if you expand that, that would mean that all laws have a sort of what we call situational ethic to them, which is common sense. My favorite example with my students is uh, Anne Frank hiding in the attic in Amsterdam. Nazis knock on the door. Uh, we heard that maybe there was a Jewish family that uh, is coming and going or, you know, just stories about you have, oh, no, we don't have anybody search the attic. And apparently they did. They searched, but they were in a hidden area. Right. So what are they supposed to say? Like, oh, yeah, we don't believe in lying. You know, there's a commandment. We're Christians. Uh, you, thou shalt not lie. They're up there. You, I guess you'll have to take them and send them off to the gas chambers, you know. I mean, it's kind of a silly example. But the point is, I think almost anyone would say, just by common sense, that, yeah, you can have laws, but then there's always circumstances that determine the meaning of those laws. And that's what halakha is. Halakha is the interpretation of how to keep the Torah. Now, right. this group is very strict. And I think they would have, uh, they would have hated Jesus, even though he would have had a lot of parallel, you know, thematic ideas, like maybe the new covenant or, the the end is near or that even that he's the messiah or whatever so which brings us to the question who is the teacher of righteousness and who is the teacher of lies what is going on with this 
Yeah, you got you actually you got three characters. You got the teacher of righteousness, we call him TR. You got the WP, the wicked priest, and you've got the L, the liar. Okay. Yeah. Now the liar <clears throat> is apparently part of the group. And either before or after, I think before the teacher's death, he, we don't know what his idea was, except they call him the liar. He departs from the community and takes off some followers. So they refer to several times those who departed with the liar. And we do have from the teacher, we don't know his name, but we have in cave one, by the way, the very first cave, it had these amazing scrolls, the community rule. The, uh, you mentioned the war scroll. It had the war scroll. It had a whole complete copy of Isaiah. One thing that's overlooked, the Thanksgiving hymns, they're called. 1Q Hodayot, 1QH is how it's abbreviated. A lot of those are actually written by the teacher. They're autobiographical. And you know what he says? my familiar friend who dipped his hand in the dish with me that like at a meal has lifted up his heel against me now does that remind you of anything last supper right identifying the betrayer wow among the group and he and it actually quotes that text uh it, it's amazing i mean when people saw this they go oh my god it's like he says a guy left him and betrayed him and then jesus had a guy that betrayed him and so forth so uh as far as who the teacher was uh and then we'll get to the wicked priest the teacher they say i'll use their language they said we wandered like blind men searching for the way for 20 years so the movement started before the teacher arrived this is in the damascus document which is found at qumran but we already had copies of it from the middle ages this is we don't have time to go into this thoroughly but scrolls were found around jericho in caves hidden in jars around the time of origin third century a.d right and bishop timotheus ninth century so some of those made their way down to egypt and had been discovered by uh solomon Schechter in the cairo geniza which is a uh, an old synagogue in cairo that belonged to the Karaites. but anyway we don't need the details there but anyway it, it says that we wandered like blind men for 20 years searching for the way and god raised up for us a teacher of righteousness which i would want to translate a true teacher mm. a prophet like moses so he's like a new moses who's going to now inaugurate the new covenant get a people prepared for the end of days very apocalyptic because these people think they're going to live to see the end the other thing it says about him is God made known to him all the mysteries of his, of his will, all the mysteries. So he has the interpretation of the calendar. He has interpretation of all the prophets, like Habakkuk is one of the texts. Uh, it's a text in the Hebrew Bible, and we got their commentary on it where they tell you what it means. It's amazing. It was also in cave one. And I can take the scrolls just in cave one and say everything I'm doing tonight. And this Habakkuk um, interpretation, right? Yeah. Well, well, as soon as I see this, I'm going back to Josephus when he talks about the Essenes are taking oaths to preserve the scriptures. But not only that, he says right after that, he says, and they they look for the scriptures to find uh prophecies of the current times that's right that's it's wonderful to read the habakkuk pesher and one of the things they say is the wicked persecute the righteous okay you would expect that in habakkuk because it's the babylonians when he wrote it and guess what they say interpreted this means the wicked priests who pursued the teacher to his house of exile so the teacher used to probably be in Jerusalem. He's gone out into the desert, probably Qumran, I would say. Right. Now, how can the wicked priest, who's probably the high priest in Jerusalem, if we could get the date, we could maybe identify him. Wow. And, and he goes out 
to persecute the teacher on his holy day of fasting, which is Yom Kippur, because this group's having Yom Kippur, the holiest day in Judaism, they're keeping it on a different day than the Jerusalem temple people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's supposed to be on the 10th day of the seventh month, but what is a month? And they, they have a whole different way, a solar way of doing their months. We can talk about that maybe in a future uh, yeah. interview and get into some of their specific uh, rules. But anyway, the wicked priest is the priest, I think, in Jerusalem that's in power. And it says that he at first was uh, following the right way and then became uh, evil. He departed from the way. So the liar, I think, is a, a breakoff leader, kind of like a rival that rose up and uh, betrayed the teacher and maybe said to the followers, follow me, not that teacher. <clears throat> we don't know how the teacher died. Uh, there's some indication that he might have been killed. But they expect the end 40 years after the teacher's death. That's very important. And you know, 40 years passed by the time we get the back at Pesher. And guess what? Uh, they say that uh, all the times are prolonged because God's mysteries are unfathomable. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> they don't say we were wrong about the 40 years. They say that God has extended the time. So we were right. The day of wrath was to come in 40 years because they're going by a prophecy in Daniel. And that it's like the people today do that stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, today, the tendency today is reset the date or say it really happened, but it happened spiritually. Preterism. You yeah. get that real common. Yeah. You know, like Jehovah's Witnesses, Russellites, they go like, Jesus is going to come in 1914, and then he didn't come. Well, he did actually come, but he came spiritually, not physically. Yeah. You just missed them. <clears throat> and, but and, what they say is a little different. What they say is no. The 40 years was correct. The day of wrath was set, but God decided in his mercy not to bring it on. And now there's no more calculation. Like we, it could come tomorrow, according to them. They're just ready. So that's going to ramp up the apocalypticism like you wouldn't believe, because they don't think there's anything else to be fulfilled except the intervention of God. Now, when the teacher gets killed, guess what they quote? Zechariah, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. People that know the New Testament might remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, as they're walking across the Kidron, according to the Gospel of Mark, our earliest gospel, Jesus says, it is written. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Quotes that very verse about his own demise. Now, whether the historical Jesus said that or not isn't the point. You know, that'd be hard to prove. Like on that night, he actually quoted that. But that the community is also turning to that same scripture to explain and understand the death of their teacher, Jesus, just as the Qumran group, is writing strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered after the demise of their teacher that's just amazing stuff it shows they're all swimming in the same kind of general stream but then it's got branches that go out and so forth and i think these people that uh live outside towns and villages and notice josephus says outside not inside because they have their own holiness rules their own meal preparation like they wouldn't go into any village or city, not even Jerusalem, and like drink water from a cup that another Jew in the city might invite them and say, come to my house here, have some water. No, I can't drink out of that cup. I can only use the utensils from our group because they were very much into ritual purity. <clears throat> Jesus is touching lepers. He's talking to women. He even talked to a Samaritan woman. You know, he's not that strict on the things that they thought were so important. And it's a different way of being religious, but he has all these other parallels. So and, I don't want to call it liberal Essenism because that I just don't like the connotations right. of the word liberal. 
but it's it's accommodating. It's more accommodating to human need and human welfare. But it's also in, it's also important to point out that the New Testament makes goes out of its way to sort of highlight the differences between John the Baptist and his followers and Jesus and his followers when Jesus is asked, how come you're not being like John or doing, or you know what I mean? Like there's sort of, they sort of highlight that there is sort Especially of. Especially on fasting, right? Yeah. Yes, he says, on, the, on the issue yeah. of fasting, that's what it was. That's want. right. That's right. And yet John, I would say, uh, you know, he's usually been pictured. Well, if anybody was an essay and it was John, he was really strict. And he does seem to be stricter on some things like, you know, he's a strict vegetarian. He doesn't drink wine. He has a Nazarite vow, it's called, uh, it, it seems. But he also uh, has some accommodation tendencies, if we're to believe the little bit that we have of him from the, uh, the, the source that the scholars call Q, which is this two source saying material that's in Luke and Matthew. Because there he does talk to tax collectors, Roman soldiers, and so forth. And he does address them. So I think even John would probably be considered too accommodating for this early stage that, of the group that we see in the original scrolls. They are really strict. And the people that are outside the cities and villages, they do gather once a year down at Qumran on the day of Shavuot, which is Christians call it Pentecost, they gather and they all renew the covenant. And in the scrolls, then it does mention men, women, children all together for the annual festival of the renewal of the covenant. But there's a whole plateau area that they could stay. They probably put up their tents and so forth. And I don't think they were invited into that inner camp where the celibate males are living because that would you know defile they would consider that defiling so wow well um is there anything else that you think needs to be said and uh, regarding these topics before we um before we close this out there's uh if we do other shows there will be other things that we could uh talk there's, about because there's so um, much that we can get into that we have, we just touched the surface here. exactly yeah and I want to, you're going to mention this, and you always are real good at uh, pointing people to some of my other resources, but there's one uh, YouTube lecture I have in particular on my station. It's James Tabor videos on YouTube that I think people would really uh, appreciate hearing because it gives the details of this teacher and his death. And Absolutely. that's Dead Messiahs Who Don't Return. Yeah. And I know that's a provocative title and... You should see the comments. People are going like, oh, you're going to go to hell. You don't believe, you know, that Jesus right. is the Messiah. And I, it's not even about Jesus. They didn't even watch it. They just saw the title. And no. What, what I say is every Messiah I know of is dead and none of them have returned. Yeah. It's, it's just a statement of observation. And by it's the not way, a statement of judgment. It's not a statement of faith or non-faith. It's an observation. And your other video... um, it's called Who Wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, that would go over a lot of this material that we've covered, but in a different way, yeah. And that's that I watched that video, and that's what got me down into this path of yeah. trying to get. So that's another one you should go check out. The link's in the description. Anyone who wants to check it out, right in the description. Just click right on there. It'll bring you right there. Subscribe to James Tabor. Make sure you do that. He's putting out really good content. He's also bringing back old interviews that aren't on the web yet and bringing them to this audience that you can watch. It's all really good educational stuff. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. And you know, if we do talk again, there's any number of things, but one of the things that I think would be really interesting is what I mentioned. What is the Dead Sea Scroll Bible? Like if not that it's bound together and they carry it around a Bible, right? but the books of the Hebrew Bible that they are reading, how do they differ from the Masoretic text, which is the traditional right. Jewish text. Now, have you heard of the Bible codes? You know, where people do, they count letters of the oh, Hebrew yeah. Bible. Yeah. Guess what? If you move one letter, the whole thing like goes yeah. off. Well, do you, but do what you, if you have whole words different and whole phrases different? Then what's going to happen? The thing is, when you start adding and pulling in other phrases and taking out phrases in their tradition, 
you know, it does kind of mess up the code. But if you're dealing with just the opening of Genesis, it's it actually happens to be really, really close. And we don't have every book of the Bible complete. But if we did a show on it sometime, I would probably want to focus more on Deuteronomy and Isaiah, because those are the books we have the most of. And there are significant differences. And guess what? A lot of times the Dead Sea Scroll readings agree with the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew that was done, we think, in maybe 200 BC, 150 BC. Now that's really something because that would mean that the translators in Alexandria had a Hebrew text that they're translating into Greek that's closer to what we found at Qumran. That is really significant i think so and that's what we can explore next time you have you on and um yeah everyone, okay like said, good to be with you and uh i hope everybody uh enjoys delving into the scrolls and remember read the scrolls <laughs>